uh, if a county does not desire or doesn't have the resources to continue this case management program, and I, I think calling it a case management program is a bit dry, uh, I would call it a teen prevention, pro uh, pregnancy prevention program, um, those counties that either can't or won't continue to fund that service, we may be seeing a higher teen pregnancy rate. Uh, which would increase the demand on CalWORKs. I mean, this is just a, it's a cat chasing its tail and it's a very bad cycle to be getting into. Uh, there's, cer there's certainly something to, to what you're saying there. I, I would, what I would say is that the teen parents would remain eligible for um, CalWORKs welfare to work services. They would, they would just lose out no, on, on the case. That. They right. would get that and um, well, it's the prevention, it's cutting the preventive part you, that I'm objecting to because I think it's, it's um, penny wise and pound foolish and uh, it's just not a good idea. And then uh, I'm just going to make a comment because, you know, every year I sit here, uh, since 2008 we've been cutting, 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 2008 we cut, 2009 we cut, 2010 we cut, 2011 we cut, and we've been cutting with the hope that we would someday somehow get to a better place and we're not there. Um, and I'm, for one, I'm just about reaching my fill. Thank you, Senator. Senator Wright and then Senator Emerson. Similar to where Senator Evans was going, I think I'd have a question. In, in the governor's office, does this proposal emanate from finance or from your side of the shop? And, and, I, and I'm not raising that facetiously because there'd be two completely different perspectives that I could that I could see. I mean, I would assume that you would sit down and say, what becomes the least harmful method? And finance would have an obligation to say, what yields me the largest cash benefit? And the two, I, I don't know how you reconcile those inside your shop, so I'm raising that for that reason. I mean, candidly, Senator, it's a very iterative process where we're trying to look at, from a program policy perspective, what options and alternatives can we see that will help to strengthen the program, meet requirements, et cetera. And at the same time, we're operating under a budget overhang that is inexorable in some respects, and that at the end of the day, we have to have a package that is within it. Now, clearly, you know, the legislature as policymakers, you get to ultimately set what those boundaries are in consultation with, with the governor. But the, I, 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 it is a process that goes backwards and forwards for many months. And the reason that I say that in the follow-up would be, I would feel more comfortable, some of what we're discussing tends to make it the recipient's fault. Rather than saying, we don't have enough money, and so we, the government, has to do less because we don't have enough money to do what we should do. I, I think it would be more palatable if we just said, we, we don't have enough money, therefore this is as much as we can do. And, and the reason I'm saying that is that there's a kind of, kind of fake here that we're pretending that this makes good sense. As, as opposed to right. saying that this, this is all the money we have, and I, and I get that part. If we don't have any money, this is all we can do. But I, I'd hope that we're not going to say, well, you know, retroactively you should have done this and you should have done this. I hope that we keep it on the fact that our revenue shortfall is driving what we're doing, and it's not somehow the fact that people were taking advantage of the program that we gave them to take advantage of. Absolutely, Senator. I, 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 if I could just sort of restate sort of where I started. At the beginning, this was a robust and highly successful program. The, if the resources were not an issue, if we weren't in a situation of doing less with less, I don't think the conversations of the last several years would have been occurring, and I don't think that we would have been in, facing the necessity to try to if, determine how to refocus the program within terribly restrained resources. That, but that your point but, is absolutely but, correct. But see, that's I mean, and again, it doesn't necessarily change what you propose. But I think that that's important. I mean, having been old enough and around here long enough, when we were setting up what was then called CalWORKs, changing from from AFDC, I just want us to be clear as we're going forward that, as you just stated, this is about revenue shortfall and not the fact that people were stealing money from the program or that the welfare queens, I mean, because what happens is that the discussion begins to shift 
that we make the recipient's fault. I think, you know, I'm also with the chair that whenever we do something retroactively to people, I think that that's something that, you know, even under the worst case scenario, I think we have to find another means other than to say to somebody, what you did last year was perfectly legit under the program, but now we're gonna bust your chops for it because we made a retroactive decision in order to do that. I just, I just don't think on its face that that's an ethical thing to do to someone. I mean, it's not, it's not your fault, but I'm, I'm, I'm raising that. And I think the other side that I would, would make as well is, is if we're going to say to someone that you have to get a job and then we recognize that there are none, you know, we, we may as well say, why don't you go high jump 10 feet? I mean, you can't do that either, but I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm not trying to, to be facetious, but if, if we're going to make a goal something that is clearly unattainable, then how do you then penalize somebody for not being able to do something that we knew they couldn't do? It, it would be fairer to say, you know, this is a challenge and we may have to make a proportional reduction, but you know, let's not pretend that you proposed something that was an achievable goal for the people that you gave that challenge to. We'll leave that as a comment. Jacob Poor with the Department yes, of Finance. Um, thank you for, uh, again, to the members for having this uh, hearing today on uh, the Governor's CalWORKs uh, proposal. Um, just to um, you know, kind of provide a little bit more on the on the question by uh, Senator Wright. Um, you know, we we understand the administration does understand that this is a difficult uh, you know proposal. Uh, it it um, I don't think there's any view on our end that you know there this this is a substantial change from where we're at now, uh, how the program operates now. Um, as Senator Wright said, yes, we do have uh, a problem right now in terms of a structural deficit. Um, this governor is uh, you know, proposing uh, to, to balance uh, the budget on, um, you know, with, with additional revenues and expenditure reductions. So I just, wanted to point out, and I hope that nobody leaves here today thinking that there was not a lot of thought um, that went into the governor's proposal. Um, we, we understand that it's, again, it, it, is, it is not going to be seen uh, as a favorable proposal by most, but we do believe that, you know, we've, we, we, we want to, what we're presenting is a new structure for the program that allows us to number one, live with hopefully within our revenues and also uh, addresses some of the federal uh, TANF requirements that are um, you know, hanging over uh, the state right now. So, um, but I definitely uh, we appreciate the comments by, by right. Mr. Wright. Mr. Chair, but again, and, and I don't begrudge you because when you have a shortage of money, it, it requires choices, but I mean, Senator Evans said something that probably flew by a lot of people. What we will be doing perhaps will leave people out in the cold. I mean, part of leadership means that you have to address that. I mean, what she said about whether those people who would simply not receive service who are receiving it, you have made for, for whatever reason, and I'm not questioning the motive for the reason, but you've made a decision that they're going to be SOL. Now, that, that, that's not to say that you made an error or that you're callous or that it, well, I mean, because having a shortage of revenue means that you have to make hard choices. But once you make the choice, then you have to live up to it. And you have to say, I made a decision, we made a decision collectively, whether it was finance and the department together, we made a decision that with the amount of money that we had, that this group of the population was going to be cut off. We don't like it, but that's a decision that we made. And let's not pretend that somehow that somebody's gonna come down 
and take care of them from something else. It's a hard decision that we have to absorb. And some of us on this side of the table will have to do that as well. But let's not pretend that the fairy is going to show up and somehow there's a magical formula that takes care of them. That's all I'm saying. So let, let's address it forthrightly and say, this is all we can do. Thank you, Senator. Uh, colleagues, I just want to keep in mind, we had hoped that we'd get through the first half of the agenda by 12.30. We still have another panel to welcome and hear from. If we were to conclude this and get through that panel by one o'clock, uh, we'll be shortening our lunch by about a half hour. So that's our time frame right now. Senator Emerson. Yeah, um, I, I wanna uh, thank everybody here. I, I, I know this is a difficult situation, but I have two uh, questions to, to uh, the department and then one question uh, to the Department of Finance. Um, to, to the uh, department, um, these are more technical questions. Yeah. I'm not getting into the issues about you know the cuts and all that. Uh, would the families um, on the child maintenance program count towards the state's work participation rate under your new reforms? There are several parts to to the answer, Senator. Those we'll talk about this family, those children who are in households in which the parent is not eligible to work do not count towards our requirements under the work participation rate. They're exempted. Um, those families that are in what, what we call the safety net caseload are largely countable towards our work participation rate. Um, as the child maintenance program is developed outward, part of the discussion within the administration is can we over time move portions of it into general fund funding outside of the block grant or the maintenance of effort requirement. Depending on how that can be done, it may be possible to exclude some of those from counting. We're not yet at a point where we can say for sure that we can exclude part, not all. So that, that's, the, that's the so far question. Okay. Uh, second question I have to you. We, we've had a lot of discussion over, over the years that our, our grant levels for CalWORKs are based uh, on the right. 1987 level. Can you give a little more information about how much more is being spent on services in addition to those Cal grant? Your office let me know that that, that, there was, that, that was a question, Senator, so I sort of went back to try to, to, to identify as best we could what services spending was in that era versus now. First, I, they're absolutely not apples to oranges because things were not being funded in the same categories or buckets. So it's, and, and the year, the base year that I can actually get data for is 1990, not back to 87. But in 1990, we had approximately $200 million in services that I can identify that were being spent in the, what was then the AFDC and the GAIN program. Now the GAIN program addressed only a small relatively portion of the caseload. It was not an attempt to universally engage all people who didn't have a, a health-related exemption. Currently, we're spending about 800 plus million in welfare to work services for the whole population. And there's an additional allocation of about 120 million for behavioral health, mental health, drug alcohol services that are counted apart from that. So there's services growth, but also a much broader population that has to be served with that. And uh, obviously, the, these are services that the recipient can't spend. I mean, they're services provided to not consumable uh, services. All right, uh, thank you. I, right. I, will, I, I serve on budget sub three, right. so. Uh, we, we may have some more discussions uh, on, on this whole situation at that point. Uh, but that's a, a good start for, for us. I, I thank you for that. Uh, to the Department of Finance, um, can you provide me with the fiscal impact or erosion of savings of these CalWORKs reductions that are not implemented by March? The governor originally wanted these implemented by March. So can, um, can you... Um, Tell me what impact this is going to have on budget since 
we're obviously not going to make it. By yes, morning. sure, uh, Senator Emerson. Um, we have some uh, estimates. I mean, these are these are fairly rough, but but we think that it, it's close. Actually, a one month delay. We're not. We would not assume any erosion of savings. So from March first to April first. Um, continuing uh, delays beyond that. Um, every month of delay is approximately $135 million in eroded savings. Thank you. That's for the entire billion dollar savings proposal of CalWORKs, or does that also include childcare? No, that is that is just the, the CalWORKs side. It's just CalWORKs, okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hancock, and then maybe we can conclude and move on to our last panel before we get to our okay. break. Yeah, I have some questions and comments, and I want to do this in the interests of making a modest proposal that we don't do business as usual this year like we always do, where um, there's a lot of bureaucratic talk about savings and solutions. <laughs> there's a lot of anguish on the part of we can't ethically do this to people. Um, and there's a lot of non-acknowledgement of elephants in the living room, literally, like why we cannot raise revenue in this state because it takes a two-thirds vote to raise any fee or tax or even have a tax election or close a tax loophole that we enacted with a simple majority. And um, I, I really resonated with Senator Wright's comments about we've got to be honest, I, this isn't going to make a better program. And, you know, many of us who can remember when we did have a robust CalWORKs program that actually moved people off <laughs> of what we used to call welfare and that brought the caseload way, way down. And that this is not going to do that. I, I, I read this, quite honestly, as triage. A, de, a policy decision, which I really hope will be heard in policy committee, uh, that we're going to triage the most challenged people. That somehow we're going to concentrate the resources on the people who can find unsubsidized employment in this economy and hold it for 24 months and then they can have another 24 months and their children will get benefits as well. Um, uh, let alone the statistics that we saw today about the availability of those jobs. Um, but also, I, I, and this is a serious question, I've never had any, I never dared to ask it till yesterday in our budget meeting, but what do we think will happen to the most challenged people who were triaged, who were essentially denied access to the lifeboat? Um, will they just die? Um, will there be health costs associated with their dying? Will they get desperate and rob a liquor store or beat up somebody to get their wallet? Um, and how are we intending to compensate for any projections about what they will do. Because if we don't, we're playing a numbers game. And, um, and then, unfortunately, there, we have no of my Republican colleagues are not here. But there is a reason that we can't get more revenue. And, and I see where the, they're going with the line of questioning. Is there a claim to be made that once you count in food stamps um, and Medi-Cal or whatever, th this is an adequate sum of money to expect people to emerge from poverty. <laughs> and I would like to know from them uh, what information they need to ascertain that, because otherwise they should join us in trying to get enough revenue so that we can maintain this very limited program. Um, and we should all be willing to look at that information. But I mean, I guess um, we're going to have to just be really honest with each other about what's going on here. And is there any factoring into the public safety budget, which I have to look at and other people do, um, or the health committee budget, what's going to happen to these people? 
If, if I could, Senator, and, and maybe just sort of address a couple of pieces of, of what you were talking about. Um, first, the point that I, I think we've always tried to make is that the most of the cash grant people receive is spent on housing. So anything outside the cash grant doesn't help them with that need, and, and we just want to recognize that. Um, there, however, nutrition benefits, medical benefits, et cetera, are, are critical and important, and that's the, the fact that they're integral to the program are important to people's lives, and so we, 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 we continue there. In 2010, when, when we sort of look at the exits from the CalWORKs program, about 48% of the people exiting had earnings. Um, and so th there's d d definitely some that we know of, and other people may not have mm -hmm. dec declared and just left the program. The key thing that I, I, I did not mention previously when we described the child maintenance component of the program, and it, it that within it, the intent being that people who are work eligible, although they haven't been able to meet the requirements to continue receiving the CalWORKs ben uh, cash benefit, that each six months they would have access to child care, et cetera, so that they could try to re-engage in the labor market. So the goal is not to sort of say to people, there's no, you, you can't go anywhere from here. Rather, it's to keep giving opportunities and options for people to re-engage. It's, we have not, as I said before, done any, made any behavioral assumptions at this point. So there hasn't been any modeling as to, is this going to affect um, other costs in the community? The one piece that we are particularly trying to explore at this point is within the child maintenance program with the new expectation that we would have medical examinations on a regular basis for children. The hope is, and even though this may in fact be a cost driver somewhere down the line, the hope is, is that those examinations will lead to more routine, further care that for more kids. I mean, a lot of kids are already getting it, it's fine. But for any who aren't, the hope is that this will lead to more access of care because that is what we're here for. Um, but beyond that, there haven't been cost assumptions made that other local costs would result in the legal side or anywhere else. Can I just make a quick, one other quick comment, which I really want to see factored into this discussion, and that is what happens to the very youngest children? Because I actually do think that even if you have a well child once a year health benefit, what happens if that child is, is malnourished? Because we know that that really affects school performance and other things. And I, I, I just read a chilling Tufts University study uh, several years ago about the effects of malnutrition on brain development, which Professor um, Dur Barak was commenting on, that literally if a child is malnourished in certain ways, the synapses in the brain that allow attention to be focused and information retained do not form at the same level. And I'm telling, you know, it just seems to me that there are very strong incentives to want to invest in our youngest children and and make sh and work with their parents to make sure that happens. Senator Hancock, the great questions and comments that you're making relative to the human consequences of the proposal before us is a great segue into our next panel. So I'm going to let it uh, let it stand and want to thank Mr. Euler and Mr. Lightborn and Mr. Bland for being with us today and laying out a very complicated proposal as clearly as possible, the alternatives and options that we may have before us, and the tough choices that are inevitable here. And ask that uh, Bruce Wagstaff, Mike Harold, and James Matthews join us so we can welcome you as our last panel of what was the morning and is now the early afternoon. With backup from Mr. Mecca. Of course. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Welcome, Chairman. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Bruce Wagstaff and I'm the Chief Deputy County Executive in Sacramento County over what we call Countywide Services. 
and I'm the current president of the County Welfare Directors Association of California. I really do appreciate the opportunity to testify today about the proposed changes to California's CalWORKs program, a program that I am extremely proud to have helped negotiate and implement in the late 1990s as the then Deputy Director of the Welfare to Work Division at the California Department of Social Services, a position I held for about 10 years under both Republican and Democratic governors. I'm pleased now to have this opportunity to work with Mr. Lightborn, a former county colleague in his new role as uh, DSS Director, and commend the governor on that appointment. And we also, and I think this needs to be noted from the county perspective, uh, commend the governor on his commitment to a balanced approach to the budget crisis our state faces, including revenues and not just cuts, as well as his commitment to giving counties the necessary tools to operate the programs on the state's behalf, including constitutional protections for realigned programs. So we felt that needed to be stated. Um, and it also goes without saying, I hope, that the counties are committed to working with the administration and your committee as we consider the future of the CalWORKs program. Um, CalWORKs has been a highly successful effort and shows that a strong partnership between the state and the counties can achieve excellent results. I think we can all be proud of the program's achievements over the last 15 years. We've helped millions of Californians gain work experience, training, and skills that have helped them move off the welfare rolls and into the workforce. And we provided a crucial safety net for low-income children that has been responsive during the Great Recession. That said, regarding the things that you've heard from the other panelists today, regarding the effects of the economy and our caseloads and our clientele, I can confirm from the local level that what they're saying is absolutely correct. We are operating in a rapidly changing environment and many of our clients are experiencing great difficulty competing in the labor market. They're competing against people who have advanced degrees and many years of skilled work experience or for limited job slots, for limited jobs in our economy. Certainly those that pay enough or offer significant hours to make ends meet for a family. When we look at the CalWORKs program and how it might evolve in the coming years, I think it is critical to recognize the realities of the economy. And unfortunately, I'd have to say that the governor's proposal does not sufficiently reflect those realities. I'd like to share with you some lessons that I've learned from my 30 plus years of experience in the human services area at both the state and the local level. Because I think these lessons are very applicable to your discussion and to the proposed changes that you are considering today. First, and you've already heard this, but I want to say it myself, that I've seen that the impact of poverty on children and communities is significant, and steep grant cuts that place more children into poverty have already had negative impacts on our CalWORKs parents' ability to keep roofs over their children's heads. Research finds that children who grew up in poverty have lower educational attainment and poorer health outcomes, as Senator Hancock just made reference to, than their high, higher income peers, and these differences persist into adulthood. This has negative impacts on the community, which in turn affects families, and it thus becomes a cycle that is very hard to break out of. Applying this lesson to the proposal before you, it is important to be mindful of the very sudden effect of a significant reduction in aid to children through the additional cuts that are being proposed just about a billion dollars in total cuts to the program. If this program, if this proposal is enacted, 63,000 recipient families with 125,000 children will lose all aid because their incomes would be too high for the resulting new eligibility thresholds. And about 42,000 of these cases, which would include about 85,000 children, would lose eligibility on a single day. And I'm trying to imagine that day in our field offices, what that would be like. Would you repeat that figure for us? About 42,000 of these cases, including 85,000 children, would lose eligibility on a single day. And this, I believe, is based on numbers from the department's uh, material they provided right. in, in various discussions. Those that are left would see the average grant for a family of the two children drop to less than 30% of the federal poverty level. This reduction means a 41% drop in the level of assistance to more than 110,000 families. That's a lot of numbers, and they're very stark numbers. 
that would have a very real and a very lasting negative impact on these children, their families, and their communities. And I must tell you that I've heard strong concern from my child welfare staff about the potential effects of further reductions to child-only grants for non-needy caretaker relatives. Uh, these relatives are caring for children who would very likely become foster children in the absence of a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle who steps forward to care for them. And we're worried that we will have to find homes with strangers for more of these children if the grants are cut to such a low level that their relatives can no longer care for them. So that's a very real concern at the local level. Now the second lesson that I would share with you is that the lives of the people we serve are not linear. And we'd all love to think of programs like CalWORKs as providing a ladder to self-sufficiency like an escalator to success. However, the reality that I've seen, and I'm sure Frank would make, back me up on, is that our families uh, take, for every two steps that they take up, they most frequently take a step back. So it's not this linear thing. It's, you know, you're going back and forth. And we really do deal with that every day. They often drop one step back due to the complex circumstances that they face in their lives and their communities. Mr. Agsaf, if you could wrap it up. I will soon. do that. I'm sorry, we're on limited um, time. So that really bears thought as it relates to the time limit. Um, I want to also say that um, it's very important when you look at CalWORKs, and we debated this long and hard in our debates in this room and elsewhere, to have a mix of services. Um, that's what's made CalWORKs successful. And our message has been work first, not work only. But we actually think the work only message that the proposal before you sends could have an absolute, uh, actually a reverse effect of discouraging our clients from, protect, uh, from accepting part-time positions because they won't have enough hours to meet the federal work rate and therefore they won't get the necessary childcare and necessary services. The last lesson that I think is a very important one that I want to share with you, and I've learned this the hard way, in all facets of our jobs, keep it simple. Keep it simple. And I've learned that you have to be able to explain program changes to workers and clients in plain language and have the changes make sense to them or you'll never achieve the desired effect. And I think this proposal really raises significant challenges in that respect. And I'm trying to imagine our CalWORKs orientation sessions as we're describing CalWORKs basic, then CalWORKs advanced, then the changing district guard and all that. Very difficult. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and to offer the perspective of both a county administrator and a former state implementor um, regarding the proposal before you. And as I said earlier, um, we're here to work with the committee, with the legislature, with the administration. We realize the task ahead of us is very difficult and we really intend to do our part. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagstaff. Uh, Mr. Harrell, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, Mike Carroll with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today about the CalWORKs program, which I, I want to underscore from the perspective of legal service advocates is the best anti-poverty program the state of California has ever had. It continues to serve uh, our clients in very important ways not a perfect program, we have ideas about how to fix it, but we think that it's absolutely crucial that this body understand how important this is to keeping um, uh, not allowing those deep poverty rates that you saw at the beginning of your presentation to grow and mushroom on you. That's what this proposal is really about. That's what you're really being challenged by. Um, there were a couple of factual questions. I'm just going to hit these very quickly. 17% of Californians receive subsidized housing assistance in California. The national average is 24%. So we are significantly under the national average. And I would note, most people get housing assistance. It's, it's um, earmarked mostly to the seniors, disabled, and homeless. They are the first three that get assistance. And then after that, all other eligible recipients can become eligible. So actually, the percentage of, of, of welfare recipients who actually get subsidized housing is sadly pretty low. Um, uh, I would also note that, in our judgment, a better way to evaluate the value of the grant um, is not so much the median income as proposed by the LAO. 
Uh, what we prefer to use is looking at the fair market rents across all states. Um, now, when you look at that, California's grant at the current level would, uh, the comparison to the, uh, the rents at the bottom 40% of the rental market, we rank 27th of all states, pretty much about in the middle, about how much of our grant pays the actual housing costs in our state. But if we go to the child, if the child's maintenance program were to be approved under the way the administration proposed it, the, the grants in the child maintenance program would drop California to 48th against the fair market rent. Uh, we'd only be ahead of two other states um, in terms of how much our grant level would actually meet real housing costs in our state. Texas and which other? <laughs> I can't recall the other. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I just wanted, those were some issues that had come up. I just wanted to provide some information for the committee on those. Um, one thing I would say, um, you know, I think underlying this proposal, while the administration says they don't have any behavioral um, they, they don't know how, how this will change the behavior of families. It's clear from the design of this that the intent is that they believe if we reduce grants for families, some people will have a greater incentive to go to work. And so we've, we've looked at the data on that very issue. And actually what we've learned is that there's really no correlation between grant levels and the percentage of, of low income women with children who don't have a high school education. That's a proxy for the TANF recipient around the country. There is no correlation. When you looked at states like Florida and Texas, California, where all about 55, 60% of the women in that category work across the states, Florida has a $300 grant level, Texas has a $200 grant level, we have a $600 grant level. What does make a difference, and again, this goes back to your earlier discussions this morning, education. Once a, the, a woman with children has a high school diploma, their percentage of them with earnings from work goes up about 10 or 12 points. If they have a little bit of community college education, some, some college, it goes up again by another 10 or 12 points. So the key for moving people out of poverty is ensuring that they get the education that they need. And when you look at our population today, for example, San Francisco County did a study of recipients. 52% could not read at an eighth grade reading level. 83% could not do eighth grade math. So how do we expect to, these folks to compete in a job market with such high unemployment, with so many previously experienced and skilled and educated workers out there, if they don't even have a GED or they can't even function at a higher than an eighth grade level in math and reading? It's just unrealistic to think that that's gonna work. And that's why the 24 month clock, for the same reason, is unrealistic. Um, people with this level of skills are going to end up in adult ba basic education programs. They're going to end up in remedial courses in community colleges prior to even being able to go get an associate degree in a job field that might be expanding and available to them in the future. So the notion of a two hard two-year time limit simply doesn't work. And in fact, we used to have a 24-month time limit when we started the program, and we eliminated it because so many families were having to appeal and go beyond that because they could not complete their welfare to work program. We changed that rule in 2004 when resources were much more plentiful and, and unemployment was far lower. It was already the case. So again, it's hard for us to view how this proposal can really work in, in today's world when it didn't work in the past. Um, the bottom line for this proposal is um, we will result, there will be fewer families working, uh, fewer families getting education and training, more families in deep poverty, and at the end of it all, the state still won't be meeting federal work participation rates. It's just very hard for us to see why we should embrace this proposal. Now, you know, we do think there are things that could be done. We think there are lessons that we can learn from our, our 15 years of running the CalWORKs program. One of them is that subsidized employment, which we ignored for the first 13 years of the program, really works. And we ought to be doing more of that. That lifts people's incomes up. They get to take advantage of the earned income, federal earned income tax credit. And those children who we focus so much attention on aren't going to be as malnourished. They will have that opportunity to develop. We also, also should be looking at what other states are doing. It's true, other states, some other states are not meeting work participation, but when you look at the states that are, 
They are maxing out the opportunities to get people educational opportunities. They're putting a full 30% of their caseload into vocational education programs. Kentucky is the role model around the country right now for this approach. They are making sure that their folks get education and those vocational education slots count as full-time work under the federal rules. We are not using the federal rules wisely. And by the way, partial participation would require a statutory change. Unfortunately, we can't do that at the regulatory level. I wish we could. Um, so we look forward to working with the committee on this, but we're asking you to reject this proposal. It will not serve our families. It will leave more people in deep poverty. And frankly, at the end of the day, that's not in anyone's interest in the legislature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Harrell. I'm gonna have a question or two for you when we complete our presentation. And I wanna welcome James Matthews. And I know you've got a very personal and important story for us to hear. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, um, <clears throat> especially those of you that are still here. Before I begin, I'd like to read a passage from Proverbs 29, verse seven. And it says that the righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. I'm James Matthews and I am with Lifetime. I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. I'm a father of four children. I have owned three businesses. For almost seven years, I worked as a mortgage originator in Riverside County. And for a period of time, I enjoyed a low, comfortable six-figure income. I had been gainfully employed since the age of 18. I started working when I was in 14. When I was 14, I mowed lawns. I worked at a public pool, cleaning pools. When I was on active duty in the Marine Corps, I worked three jobs simultaneously to support my family. And in 2007, my dream, like so many others here in California, was crushed. My family experienced the loss of our home. Both of our cars were repossessed. Our savings evaporated. Our health insurance was eliminated and we downsized from a comfortable home in Murrieta to a 500 square foot, one bedroom apartment in which we still live. At the time, my wife and I were waiting joyously for the birth of our next child. The stress of the circumstances were most difficult for my wife. When we made application for assistance through Medi-Cal, I was told, we're sorry. You made too much last year. My wife experienced the pain the most. She suffered a miscarriage. I learned what it feels like to be rejected for a good paying position because I did not have a college degree. I learned what it meant to be called overqualified for a low end positions and I learned what it meant to be called underqualified all at the same time. I never thought I would be a CalWORKS parent. I never thought I would be on food stamps. I never thought I would be on welfare. From fall of 2007 through the fall of 2008, I tried desperately to find work in another field. I tried the classified ads. I went to job fairs visited the unemployment office frequently. I applied at websites like monster.com and jobs.com. I went to a place called the work source in El Monte. I even attended a state funded program called job club where the workers had me helping others with resumes because mine was already done. And one of them even told me, don't feel bad. I'm having to look for a new position myself. Even with all of these avenues, I was unable to find gainful employment. No degree, sorry. Olympic staffing in Covina wouldn't even take my application or resume for a position I had experience with because my experience wasn't recent enough. It was for an administrative assistant position 
When I was on active duty as a Marine stationed at Camp Pendleton, I was an administrative assistant to an, ex, to an S6 officer who reported directly to our battalion commander. We handled millions of dollars worth of logistical requests from 11 different commodities on our battalion. I was filling a billet for a staff sergeant as a Lance Corporal. Did I have experience? I guess it wasn't recent enough. In addition to that, for seven years as a mortgage lender, if you don't have an administrative assistant, you are an administrative assistant, but it still wasn't good enough. I was told that the employers that had hired them to find workers didn't want people from my possession, but, but, uh, uh, profession. I was told I was a flight risk. I wasn't a flight risk. O.J. Simpson is a flight risk. <laughs> I've heard people say that those without degrees have a 14% or higher unemployment rate. I believe it. While those with degrees are around 4%. I'm working towards that. The lowest point for me was when I tried to make application for a counter help position at McDonald's. I just wanted a job, any job. We're sorry, Mr. Matthews, we're really looking for Spanish speaking counter help. Man, I wish I'd have paid attention in Spanish class in freshman year in high school. In August, of 2008, I became a statistic and joined the ranks of a growing segment of society. If you have ever seen the film Cinderella Man, where Russell Crowe plays a boxer who finds himself on public assistance during the Great Depression, then you have a glimpse of the humiliation that I felt. You have a glimpse of the humiliation that many other families and single mothers on this program feel. This semester I will graduate from Mount San Antonio College with two degrees. Last weekend I spent the majority of my time looking for work. I still see an economy that is nowhere as robust as is portrayed when I speak to other college students who are not CalWORKs parents that have bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and they struggle to find work. If they have a hard time finding work, how much more difficult is it for those with families? Please do not slash or eliminate the only safety net that exists. If you do, what will happen to others like myself? My family and I still have a long way to go in order to recover from the devastation the housing market left, but we will find a way. But who will speak for those after me who will speak for those who are not here today? Will you? I am here because I fear God and he has made a way for me to be here so that you may hear my testimony. Hear me now as I plead for those who cannot hear their desperate cries through me. I would like to quote Job 30.25 in closing. Have I not wept for him who is in trouble? Has my soul not grieved for the poor? I have. Will you? Thank you for hearing me. Mr. Matthews, we really thank you for your courage coming here today, sharing your story, your family's story. Let me congratulate you in your progress, in your educational pursuits you realize firsthand how important that is. And I also just want to recognize that it's very clear how the power of your faith has sustained you through such a dark period. 
and I also have a sense that you're going to see a much brighter day. But you're speaking for so many who can't, and that's the value of your presence here today, so thank you. So, where to begin? I think that you have certainly highlighted very clearly for us the human consequences that Senator Hancock was raising just a few moments ago. I want to ask any of you here, we have limited time, we've got few options before us, and I don't want to suggest that any of you are fully expert or knowledgeable in all the areas of our budget. But knowing the facts that we face, the majority party cannot do its job because of two-thirds vote thresholds. If we could, we'd find a way to raise some new revenue in the coming months. The governor's proposal for November will forestall deeper cuts in the future but doesn't help us balance our budget by the middle of June. We all recognize the importance of education. That's been repeated and repeated and repeated. That represents half our budget. So the question is, if you have any suggestions as to alternatives to the governor's proposal, specifically with regard to CalWORKs, or what other areas in the budget might you suggest we find some savings? Because of course, if we don't accept one way or the other, the governor's billion dollar target to balance the budget through CalWORKs reductions, if we were only to make it 500 million, which would be painful enough, where we might find that kind of sum of money elsewhere. So I just throw all that out for any kind of discussion we could have in the next few minutes. If we were to break by a few minutes after one, I still want to be back here by 1.30 so we don't go much later than four because we still have, of course, our child care proposals to hear today. So, Senator, I'll just offer- Jump right in. Yeah, I'll just offer a couple of quick comments. And uh, as it relates to what I would suggest with respect to CalWORKs, I want to echo what Mike said a few minutes ago that in our county, we had tremendous success mm -hmm with the unsubsidized work effort we were able to launch with the federal stimulus funding, uh, when was that, about a year ago or so. Um, what that really takes is some seed money to get that started. But in my years of dealing with the program, um, that clearly stood out as uh, a very worthwhile effort and made the biggest difference and I think has potential for savings. Um, you know, I don't dispute, for example, what uh, the, the administration is saying about the situation with our work participation rate. We know that's an issue uh, that we have to address. My county, like many others, has seen a dip in that number with the recession. We're trying to get it back up. But what I would suggest is an approach there that's similar to efforts that we took, frankly, when I was at the state level, recognizing the brain power at both the state and the local level to get together in a partnership, and we've talked to Director Lightborn about this, forming a group to really compare best practices, put on some forums, and really see what we can do with the private sector to turn that number around. Um, and I, I really have questions whether what's on the table now would have that effect. Thank you, Mr. Wagstaff. Mr. Harold. Um, you know, the, this is a program that was a compromise when it was created in 1997. And um, as part of that compromise, you know, we sort of have, how should I say this, sort of a one-size-fits-all approach to the way that we uh, manage people who come to our program. They're basically set through the same exact set of steps, notwithstanding their experience, their educational levels. Um, um, and I think one of the things that we think that the committee and the legislature may want to look at is this is there potentially a more effective and efficient way for us to get people where they need to be? And, you know, there may be more than one door. Right now we have basically one door into the system. But, you know, I think unsubsid the subsidized employment taught us, I think, that there may be multiple ways that we can engage people in welfare to work 
and not necessarily always have to just go through the, the process and the steps of an assessment and development of a welfare to work plan. If someone really just needs a subsidized job and that's what they want, then maybe that's what we should make sure they get. And I think within that potentially we could, maybe there would be a, an ability for us to streamline some of that. I have no sense of what that might cost. And in some cases doing assessments of people so we do it right at the first step <coughs> might actually add some cost. But I do think that there could be ways in which we could look at the program in that way. You know, for many years, we have been advocating that the, again, I mentioned this earlier, that we don't use the federal rules particularly effectively. Again, we're sort of locked into our 1997 model. Two things that stand out. And one of them, I believe, is actually an administration proposal, which is um, for families with children under the age of six, um, people can qualify with 20 hours of work, not 30 hours of work. Um, and so I think that, you know, that potentially is something that we should be looking at is whether or not we can have some savings and perhaps, uh, as Senator Wright was suggesting, it's this notion that, you know, instead of working eight hours a day, you work six, well maybe that's, we can get more people to work, put more people into subsidized jobs if we're only going to have them do 20 hours. So I think those are a couple of ideas just off the top of my head that I think you know, we, you know, we would be open to looking at and I think um, you know, potentially, again, I, I can't underscore Mr. Wagstaff's point enough that simplicity for our workers and our recipients and frankly for our legal service attorneys is really important. They weren't on my list, but that's okay. Yeah. So uh, we'll also take your advice that we have a close look at what Kentucky is doing. Though, from what you're saying, it doesn't seem to appear that it would benefit our <coughs> work participation rate. Oh, no, no, it absolutely would, Senator, because... Uh, uh, relative to the federal rules, I mean, because if we've got people working <laughs> just under, they're not getting counted. I'm not sure what you're saying. So the federal rules, as they currently exist, yes. require for our credit for work participation rate to be how many hours? Um, you can, if 30 is the, ma is the standard rule, but if you have children under the age of six, it's 20 hours. Fed federal that's allows federal, for that. That's so the federal rule. And we've not, we don't follow that rule. We've always had a 32 Where hour. Where we're requirement. falling short, and specifically under the governor's proposal, is that we're, uh, study and training is not going to qualify. Well, it would for the first two years, but I guess my elemental point is that Kentucky and many other states have now taken an approach where you can put, you can meet 30% of the 50%, you can meet 60, well, how do you look? You can achieve all, more than half of your work participation through vocational education activities. And that's what states are doing. They're making sure that they fill that bucket to 30%. And then they don't have to rely on so much on unsubsidized employment to meet the remaining 20%. Our state's approach has always been to get people into work and to do unsubsidized employment. And it's only after they fail that that, that we then consider a welfare to work plan that would get them into school or education. And Kentucky is now doing assessments up front where they're saying, you need education, you need a skill, we're not gonna try to make you go through an unsubsidized job and waste money on you that way. And plus, we're gonna meet the federal work participation rate because those all 12 months on voc ed count towards the work participation. Very good. Mr. Mecca, I suspect you, you have you something to say here. Uh, with respect to the, the work participation rate and your, your question to us about what, what could we do as an alternative to this, I, I think it's important to look at a budget savings target differently from uh, how do we strengthen the CalWORKs program if money weren't an issue, and then what do we do to manage a federal work participation rate that we think is unfair and badly calculated. Uh, on the work participation rate, I think it's really important to point out that the governor's proposal doesn't really improve the work participation rate. But by taking out, by kicking off of CalWORKs families who have mixed earnings with a check, we're taking out people who meet the work participation rate. Um, the way the governor's proposal is, is overall structured, the, the, there's a, a, a sort of a, a focus on um, only allowing work as an activity, but overall, um, that component of the governor's proposal doesn't improve the work participation rate. The governor's to be commended and the Department of Social Services is to be commended for uh, features in the proposal, uh, a feature called WINS, which we've talked in this committee before, a supplemental um, uh, 
nutritional as, uh, assistance, and they propose um, something for childcare that could substantially increase our work participation rate. Combined with an effort like what Mr. Wagstaff um, commented, we believe that we can manage the work participation rate through the governor's innovative wins programs and through a collaborative state county partnership on, uh, on work participation. Uh, the, the other thing about the governor's proposal I just have to say is that the, the governor, um, the administration has discussed the proposal as in part deriving from the, the need to get rid of the temporary exemptions and the disinvestment in work caused by the last couple years of the large single allocation cut. I think it's important to point out that there's a bigger single allocation cut in the governor's proposal than there is in current law. The governor's proposal effectively continues the single allocation cut because between, uh, what, a, between what a county gets this year to help people move from welfare to work and what the governor would propose, overall there's a $100 million reduction. So under the proposal, despite its limitations on supporting people who are only working and what they would characterize as a focus on work. There's a hundred million dollars less worth of services, transportation and childcare to help people move um, from welfare to work. So as we talk about how do we improve the program, improve the work performance, I think we have to understand those features of the governor's proposal vis-a-vis -vis current law. Thank you, Mr. Mecca. Colleagues, we are a little after one. We're gonna reconvene in 25 minutes. Live with that, all right. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us, and a special thanks you to you, Mr. Matthews, and you give our blessings to your family, please. All right. We are in recess until 1.30, thank you.